So our third speaker tonight is Michael Dillon. Uh, Michael Dillon has been active in the Film Studies Department since his freshman year. In his time here, he has managed to complete not only a senior thesis film, but also two independent projects that have premiered at the MFA in Boston with fellow students. He has also worked as the videographer for Boston College's orientation program, and when she had the opportunity to produce a short documentary about the Jesuit tradition here at BC. His love of J.R.R. Tolkien has prompted much independent study and the inspiration for his talk tonight. His talk will discuss how no other generation has been more trained to receive stories. With the dawn of social media, we have been introduced to a new form of storytelling, where we are able to become the authors and heroes. I am pleased to welcome Michael Dillon. Thank you for coming, guys. That means a lot. It's the first PowerPoint presentation I've given in probably a few years, and they just handed me a laser pointer. So this should be fun. I also might be a pain for you, Max. I pace around much more than the previous speakers. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael Dillon. Um, so this is, in fact, my name. But as you may have put together, this is certainly not my face. Uh, this is a picture of my roommate, Jeff Travella, who is in the room somewhere. And this is going to come back later on. But just remember this photo and this kind of setup right now. I want to start off with this idea that we are the greatest receivers of story in human history. This is an idea that a former screenwriting professor at BC used to start every class by reciting. Um, it was this idea that throughout history we've developed a number of storytelling techniques, but they never disappear. We only create new ones. And the most modern form of storytelling is filmmaking. And that's something that our generation has had access to through Netflix, through being able to go to the theater, or through home theater systems. We've had access to it like no one else ever has. We now all have cameras in our pockets and can make movies at a moment's notice. But we do have to learn how to take these stories in. It's not totally natural for us at first. But by the time we're young adults, it's almost pretty seamless, and we kind of take in these stories secondhand. When I was four years old, I thought the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were real. They were my favorite TV show. They were just a bunch of dudes who hung out, ate pizza, and lived in the sewers and kind of fought crime. One day, I was walking around the block with my mom. We came out in front of our house, and I was kicking stones into a sewer grate. And I had no idea what it was. And I did this all the time, and I figured it would be appropriate to ask my mom what it was I was kicking stones into. And she said, that's a sewer. And a flip switched in my head, because all I knew about sewers is that's where, is where the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles lived. And suddenly, I had a sewer grate right in front of my house. Once we got inside, I asked my mom to help me write a note to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And I brought it outside, and I dropped it in. For two weeks, that note dictated what I did from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to sleep. After two weeks of not hearing back, I figured I'd write another note. <laughs> this time when I asked my mom, she thought it might be a good idea to break the news to me that not everything you see on TV is real. It was super depressing at the time, but it's actually totally vital in any of our lives, this recognition that fiction and that what we see on TV or in film isn't always real. And that's OK, as long as we're aware of it. Story, for me, implies two things, an author and an audience. There's no story without someone to create it, and there's no reason to have story if someone's not going to hear it. And between these two things, author and audience, there's something that, after spending a few years in the film department, I've grown to really appreciate. And that is the connection that's formed through a contract or an agreement between these two parties. It's best summed up, oops, that's the laser, this idea of the suspension of disbelief. There's a constant give and take between audience and author. The suspension of disbelief is this idea that the audience is willing to ignore basic realities of everyday life for the sake of the story. We are willing to look past the fact that a lot of films are in black and white, even though the world they're supposed to depict is in color. We're willing to ignore the fact that George Lucas' Star Wars isn't real because we want to get caught up in that world. We suspend our disbelief whenever we watch shows like 24 that show every single hour of a full day and Jack Bauer never once uses the bathroom. <laughs> in exchange, we have the opportunity to be lost in a story. For as much as we're willing to give up to the author, we have, to, we have certain things that we must expect back from them. And this puts a tremendous amount of pressure on filmmakers and on directors, especially because images are so incredibly powerful. It's funny to note that over the past week, flyers with my name and my roommate's face have been all over campus. And a few people managed to include me and Jeff in group text saying what's going on, what's happening. But for the most part, 
Jeff got more comments than I did. This might just mean that Jeff is more popular than I am. <laughs> but I think it really is a tribute to how much more powerful an image is than a, than a word. People could recognize Jeff's face and they attach to him sooner than they would my name, which was right next to him. This means that as filmmakers, we have to be incredibly, incredibly careful with the images we choose to present to our audience because every single one is powerful. Once the audience suspends their disbelief and we ignore basic rules of reality, it is the author's responsibility to write a new reality. In a sense, they have to make new rules and then they have to follow those rules. We're willing to accept that J.K. Rowling can put us in a world where magic, excuse me, where magic exists. And we're willing to accept that there's a prophecy that says Harry Potter or Voldemort, one of the two has to kill the other. Even though those things aren't real. But what we won't accept is at the end of the seventh book or at the end of the seventh movie, the London police showing up and arresting Voldemort. Even though the London police are real, they're not part of this new reality we've created. It is up to the author to call their own shot, essentially, to create the rules and live by them and give us a story that our imagination can run wild in, that our imagination can get lost in. Filmmakers have to be very careful with the images that they present. And fundamental to any film is the idea that there's more than just one image. If there wasn't more than just one image, it'd be a photograph. Imagine I present to you this picture of a young boy. We could all come up with any number of stories for how he got there, where he's going. Because there's no other thing to cue us in. There's no other clue for our imagination to play off of. Now I give you this image. A lot of you have probably put together already that both these pictures are me. And you might be wondering why I'm self-centered enough to put both of these up. <laughs> but it's, I just didn't want to throw the people's faces on. I did for a while. But now that you have two images, you have a gap to fill in. And that gap exists. It's kind of a blank page between these two images. And this happens when we watch movies. You know, questions you might be asking now are, is his favorite color always been yellow? Does he still like cake? When did his hair stop being so blonde? What is in this cup? <laughs> Authors and filmmakers have the ability to direct our imaginations where they want them to go. And that is crucial because two hours of a movie have to cover an extensive amount of time. Very few movies actually cover two hours of real time. And that means we have to leave a lot of things out. And we don't want people to get lost along the way. And what that means is we have to provide images that provide clues for where our imagination should be heading. What we don't like when we watch a film is being kicked out of it. It's called breaking the fourth wall. Breaking the fourth wall is making the audience aware of what they are doing, which is watching a movie. This happens in films like Wayne's World, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Monty Python, The Holy Grail. Usually comedies do this on purpose. They have main characters address the camera, address the audience. And what it does is it kind of kicks you out of the film. You don't really have the chance to get lost in the movie because you realize you're watching a movie. And this is something that we don't like so long as the story is still going on. But it's actually crucial to our understanding or appreciation of film. And that's because at the end of every movie, credits roll. And this is the ultimate kicking out of a film, but this one is actually something we need and want. Because if we don't get kicked out of the film, we don't have that call back to reality. It's OK to get lost in a world that doesn't exist, so long as you remember to leave it at some point. Or else we're always going to be running around writing notes to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or whatever. Part two. This is where we approach why I think it's important that we're aware of this contract that exists in filmmaking. When I was a freshman at BC, um, I was a freshman guy, which meant I didn't get invited to a whole lot of parties. I spent a lot of my Fridays and Saturday nights in the Hardy basement. And I spent a lot of my Sundays on Facebook. What would happen is on these Sundays, there was this group of girls who lived two floors above us who went out what it seemed like every night of every weekend. And they'd come back and they'd post these albums with hundreds, hundreds of pictures every weekend. And I just thought in my head, oh my goodness, these girls are having so much fun. And then one night, I was out at a party and this group of girls walked in, and they were miserable. And I saw them, they didn't like who they were with, they didn't like what they were doing, they didn't like where they were, they didn't like what they were drinking. And then they did something totally unfathomable to me. And they pulled out a camera, and in an instant, they all gathered together, threw on a smile, like threw out the skinny arm, and they <laughs> took a picture. And in my head, I thought, there's no way that they put that picture up. It, this night is too miserable for them that they wouldn't do it. And the next day, that picture went up with 100 others just like it. And I felt kind of weird. My general sentiment was pretty much, <laughs> I felt betrayed. And this kind of blew my mind. 
because I wasn't really friends with these girls. I wasn't super close with them. They had no reason to like live up to my standards or my ideas of what they should be doing. And I felt like they had betrayed me for some reason. I couldn't explain why I felt this tied to them. In filmmaking, standard frame rate for any given film. So the film is just a series of pictures one after another that create the illusion of movement and the illusion of, that didn't come up, the illusion of traveling through time. But you realize this is standard, but this isn't law. You know, Peter Jackson's a director. He just directed The Hobbit. He produced that with 60 frames per second. When you work in animation, sometimes because it takes so much time to get every picture, you can work in 12 frames per second, 8 frames per second. There really is no law, and there's nothing that says that you can't have a film that doesn't operate on any more than one or two frames per second. It'd be a really terrible film, but you can have that. What I realized when I started to think about film this way is that this is kind of what we're watching when we go on Facebook. The reason I felt such a tie to these girls who were putting up albums is because when I was scrolling through those albums, the same way we all do when we scroll through albums or we scroll through people's profile pictures, we're just hitting next, next, next. And what we get is a short film with just a really terrible frame rate, but it's image after image after image. And because watching movies and watching films is so secondhand and so natural for us, our imaginations, without us even knowing it, are filling in the gaps between those pictures. And the problem is the difference between us as Facebook users and filmmakers is that there's not as much care going into the pictures we're putting up. If the pictures we put up are things that include this, followed by more pictures that include this, the blank page that we leave between them can only be filled in by so much by our imagination. Mostly this. <laughs> what we're doing is creating impossible standards for ourselves to live up to. And you might say, well, yeah, but it's just Facebook. But it's just Facebook when you're reminded it's just Facebook. The danger with it is when we, watch, when we go through these albums and we watch these short films, we're doing it at times when we should be doing something else, when we should be somewhere else, when we are in line you know, waiting for food and we can get called away from it at a moment's notice. We never have the kickback to reality that we get at the end of a short film. No credits roll. Nothing really reminds us that we're in this false world. And this makes Facebook, this allows Facebook to kind of seep into our reality. The characters we're putting online are not true representations of ourselves. I don't think anyone here would claim that they have a totally true to life representation of themselves online. I don't think anyone feels the need to have that. It's just part of what we do. It's part of our generation. We interact via social media. And I'm not saying that that's wrong. I'm just saying that we need to be reminded that it's not real every once in a while. We need that fourth wall to be breaking, broken down. If filmmakers and storytellers are the caretakers of our imagination, Facebook users are the world's worst babysitters. <laughs> Where a storyteller or a filmmaker might take your imagination out to a playground and let it run around kind of in a structured environment, you get to have fun and you get to go and play with different characters and different ideas that you've never been able to explore before. Facebook users are kind of like the babysitter that just gives you a ton of junk food and a ton of caffeine and lets you watch whatever you want. And it's super fun for a few hours, but then you hit that crash because you're not reminded to come home. You're not brought back to reality. And you're kind of left just stranded in this world. And it's exceptionally strange in a place like, you know, a college campus like BC, where the characters we interact with online are the same ones we see every day. And very often, we're interacting with these characters online more than we're actually interacting with the authors who have created them which means when we see these people in real life, we're judging them off of the characters they've created. Most often they're more perfect versions of themselves and that very often leaves us feeling as though we're not living up to a standard that we should be. <coughs> we use Facebook very often be to get these stories because getting stories and listening to stories is natural for us and we crave it. I think the best metaphor though for using Facebook as our primary source of getting these stories when we really need one is standing on a whale fishing for minnows. It's the idea that we're on a college campus surrounded by thousands of students, yet we spend time isolated trying to get these stories once removed, when the real story is sitting right next to us, right underneath us. If we're all going to be filmmakers, I think we should all at least know the rules and know that this contract does still exist and we really should honor it. Thank you.